and is, is an extremely valuable, both of them are extremely valuable resources. He now has also been editor-in-chief, I don't know he has time to do all of this, but he's an editor-in-chief of a, of a two-volume handbook on psychology of religion and health. So please give a warm welcome to Ken, and we will be our last but wonderful speaker I know. Well, thank you, John. And I, I want to thank John and the other members of the organizing committee, uh, Jim Lomax, uh, John Allen, Alex Gillen, and also uh, Jerry Doctor and uh, Stuart uh, Nelson for helping to organize such an exciting day and an exciting meeting. So thank you all very much. Um, I went into psychology because I thought that's where I'd get some answers to the big questions in life. You know, what's the meaning of it all? Um, why are we here? Um, what's the life well lived? Um, how do you understand and grapple with suffering? Uh, I was disappointed. I did my graduate training in the, in, in the early 1970s, and my first uh, living uh, client was a eight-ounce pigeon <laughs> that, I, that I shaped uh, behavior using operant conditioning principles. <laughs> and the assumption back then was that we could use those principles to shape human behavior. Uh, and it applies for certain kinds of behavior, but m m for the most part, we don't act like pigeons. It's, and it doesn't work all that well. So I started reading in religion and spirituality because I, I found that they were grappling with the questions I was most interested in. That's why I'm particularly interested in the topic of this conference, and I was really delighted to hear a conference on uh, happiness and suffering. These are issues that I was eager to hear more about, and I've just been delighted with the papers that have been presented today. I've learned so much, so thank you again to the, our wonderful speakers, Phil, John, Bob, and Anne. Thank you for your presentations. I'm really not sure how much I have to add here. I haven't done research on happiness or suffering. It's not my, um, I'm usually, I have tons of slides about research projects and things that I've been doing, but here I really haven't done much direct research in it. Um, but I have had a chance to muse about it, had a chance to think about it and to reflect on it through my clients that I've seen over the years in therapy, and I see clients one day a week in therapy, readings that I've done, and I don't think any therapist can do their work without considering the nature of suffering and the nature of happiness. This talk, though, I'm going to focus more on suffering, uh, the dark side. So uh, I, hope, I hope you find it interesting. I certainly appreciate the chance to uh, put it together. And these are the points that I'd like to make. That first of all, suffering is a distinctive phenomena that really deserves its own consideration. It's part and parcel of being human. But I don't think suffering is fully captured by our existing concepts of pain, trauma, depression. So it's an argument I'm going to make. I don't have a lot of data to support it, but I'm just going to suggest that, that we really need a psychology of suffering. Then I like to say that there's a spiritual dimension to suffering that needs to be more fully understood if we're to respond comprehensively in, in to people as whole human beings. But to quickly add that spirituality has a double-edged quality. It can be a tremendous resource in suffering. It can also make matters worse. It can exacerbate the impact of suffering. In that Spirituality should be integrated into efforts to help people who are suffering. I'll briefly highlight the contours of what I'd say is a more spiritually integrated approach to treatment, working with people who are suffering. Um, and there's uh, some of the, the ideas, I think, overlap with some of the ideas we've already heard about mindfulness and attentiveness uh, in, in this process. So uh, let me say here again that I'm not guided um, by uh, theory or a particular religious orientation in, in, in this work, this, what I'm going to present here is, uh, instead of a top-down approach of theoretically driven work, this is really bottom-up. Bottom-up by really 
talking about the lived experiences of people who suffer. And I'm drawing some conclusions from, from that. I think ultimately we need both top-down and bottom-up research. This is more bottom-up, quite inductive kind of uh, thinking that I'm doing here. Let me start off with the case of uh, someone who I think was suffering. I call her Susan. I uh, saw her a few years ago, and I remember seeing her in my waiting room, and she's about 46 years old, but she looked like she was closer to 60. Uh, she looked to me uh, very thin and gaunt. I thought she had cancer um, because she looked to be in tremendous pain. I thought she was racked with pain. She was sitting in the waiting room crying and just, just hunched over. Well, she wasn't experiencing physical pain. Um, what she was experiencing, though, was a kind of agony, even though she was in good physical health. Um, as she'd say later on, she would have much preferred the physical pain than the pain that she was experiencing, the emotional torment. Um, she'd been a successful company vice president, a marathon runner, close friends, caring parents. Uh, five years earlier, she'd experienced a major depressive episode which she couldn't tie to any particular stressor. Uh, she'd become apathetic, vegetative. She cut herself off from friends, um, felt hopeless. She stopped running. Eventually, she had to quit her job and was hospitalized. Um, she was only minimally responsive to antidepressants and unable to provide even basic care for herself. Um, she had um, ECT, which left her with significant memory impairment. Uh, in the course of the conversations I had with her, um, two themes stood out. She felt shattered. She said, my brain is broken. She'd repeatedly say, I've lost my life. I've lost who I was. I'm utterly alone. What had given her life meaning and significance had been destroyed, she felt. Her role as a successful businesswoman, her competitive athleticism, her close ties with family and friends, her sharp intellect. These were the organizing forces in her life. This was the glue that kept her life together. And now she was experiencing a sense of a loss of wholeness, a loss of integrity. She also described feelings of profound helplessness and hopelessness. Not only was her life broken, she was unable to do anything about it other than to watch helplessly. She'd say, I'm stuck. There's nothing I can do. I have no future. Now, Susan was unusual, I think, in her ability to articulate her experience. For many people, suffering um, is marked by voicelessness. Many people just can't put the experience into words. Suffering has a kind of ineffability. Now, the term ineffable is often used to describe spirituality. So, but I think suffering, like spirituality, has, uh, it, it creates a kind of lack of language, lack of words. And as a matter of fact, one of my clients, who I'd say qualified as a sufferer, used to say, when I asked her to describe what she was experiencing, she would just stop and say, there are no words. There are no words. The voicelessness may also come from profound alienation and isolation as a result of stigmatization. One woman with HIV commented on the reactions of her community, and, and here you hear the language of stigmatization. They don't want people with HIV to come to their house. They don't want to touch them. They don't want to sit beside them. Hearing comments like that, I want to explain to them and tell them what's going on, but I don't. I just back down because I think they're going to say the same thing about me. Whether suffering um, comes from its, whether the um, voicelessness comes from the ineffability of suffering or alienation and stigmatization, this makes it very challenging to help people who are suffering through a talking therapy. We're asking people to talk about something that for them is experienced as ineffable. Now there's a basic question here, and I think a really interesting and important question. Do we even need to use the term suffering? First of all, let's assume that it is definable and even studyable, and some people question that. Um, one author, A. Frank, says that suffering is the unspeakable as opposed to what can be spoken. It remains in darkness, eluding illumination. 
Now, I don't believe it must remain in darkness, or should. Uh, I think actually we have an obligation to shed light on the darkest aspects of human experience. So I don't buy that notion that just because it's hard to talk about that we can't focus on it and learn about it. But even if it is definable and studyable, do we need the term suffering? Can we just use depression or pain, severe pain? It could be argued that Susan, my client, is simply experiencing deep depression. What does suffering, if anything, add? Well, there's some literature to suggest it adds something. I um, came across an interesting study of Alzheimer's and osteoarthritis patients and caregivers where they gave them measures of physical pain, psychological distress, and existential distress, and found that these measures were only marginally related to their self-reports of suffering. So whatever was going into their own assessment of suffering, it didn't seem to be captured by other measures of distress. It seemed like there's something else going on when it came to suffering. Now, in the case of my, my client Susan, I'd argue to say that she was depressed would be accurate but insufficient. She was depressed and she was suffering. In fact, I thought she was suffering from depression. I say suffering from depression. Typically, we say someone is suffering from depression. Depression is the major phenomenon of interest. The suffering is just kind of like an add-on, but I was seeing her as suffering from depression. And the phenomena of greatest interest to me in working with Susan was the suffering. The depression, she was getting treated by psychiatrists, she's on medication, and I was doing things to help her, traditional kinds of things to help her with the depression, but the suffering went beyond that. Another study I want to mention, the study by Nancy Gravengood, one of my um, graduate students, early graduate students, uh, I have to say this study is the best study that I've ever been involved in that's never been published. So, uh, Nancy, some of my students, they graduate and they never want to do anything research again in their lives, which is actually pretty normative in clinical psychology, unfortunately. This study was one that I really wish I had uh, pushed her a little bit more on or, or published it myself. She worked with a community sample of 30 people. She advertised in the newspaper for people who said they had suffered within the last five years. And she asked the people in her sample to describe their suffering experience and to complete ratings about that suffering experience. And then she had them ask them to describe an experience that was stressful to them in the last five years, but not suffering. So it was a, a, a study where we could compare suffering and stressful experience to see were they different, were they alike. And what did we find? Well, we found really strong statistical significant differences in even a sample of 30, which is, uh, I think, um, says something about the power of the findings. Suffering was appraised as more uncontrollable, more unintentional, unavoidable, unchangeable, and tied to a more negative outlook in the future than other stressful experiences. In short, it was tied to more of a sense of that helplessness and paralysis. Suffering was also tied to more changes, changes in the participant's sense of larger or cosmic meaning, their view of themselves as human beings, their sense of control and mastery in life, their quality of relationships, and their religious life. So again, this fits with that notion of a shattered life. And suffering was also tied to reports of more symptomatic distress, a sense of timelessness or repetitiousness, that suffering just seems to have um, last forever, that you've always been suffering and you always will suffering, which I, I do find to be a, a quality of suffering, also oftentimes with depression and feelings of injustice. Now, this notion of whole life impact, I think, is the core, to my mind, of a definition of suffering. And if you look at the definitions in the literature that are out there, you see that notion that suffering impacts the whole person. Cassell defines suffering as the state of severe distress associated with events that threaten the intactness of the person. Frank defines suffering as a wound that never heals. 
and which is an ever-present disturbance in everyday life. Saunders describes suffering as total pain. Uh, that's the parsimonious approach. In a study of um, Dutch patients who were defined as people experiencing unbearable suffering, unbearable suffering, they had all requested um, uh, euthanasia. Um, Schultz and Ardiz and his colleagues found several components of suffering. There's a biological component, physical symptoms, cognitive symptoms, and what they described as misery due to medical treatment. Psycho-emotional suffering, loss of self, negative emotions, fear of the future, loss of autonomy. And socio-environmental suffering, the loss of role and status, communication problems, being a burden, isolation. And, you know, you get the sense then of suffering impacting the whole person. It's, it's a whole person kind of uh, phenomena and, and, and problem. Well, what do, what does, let me um, suggest then that preliminary as this work is, it suggests that suffering does deserve some attention as a phenomena in its own right. And um, some illumination may come from considering its spiritual side, which is what I want to shift to right now. Um, as a prelude to it, let me just share an assumption that I make about human nature that underlies the way that I think about spirituality and suffering. I can offer some empirical support, but I, I just want to make the assumption here and see what you think. The assumption is, I wish Bob were here, he could, he could see this, tied to some work of Bob Emmons, um, that we strive, that people strive. Now, this is actually a surprisingly radical assumption in current day thinking. Uh, we live in times that we see human nature in more deterministic, reactive sense that uh, we're shaped by evolution and genetics, uh, by temperament, by early childhood experience, or by biology. But this assumption suggests that those, all of those forces, as important as they are, are insufficient to describe who we are as people. And this point is uh, nicely captured by a, a quote by Steven Pinker, who actually is, I think, more on the deterministic side, but I love the quotes, so I'll just share it with you, because it's a quote that I, I subscribe to totally. Under controlled experimental conditions of temperature, time, lighting, feeding, and training, the organism will behave as it damn well pleases. <laughs> <laughs> In psychology, we may call that error variance, what we can't predict, but I actually think that error variance says something that goes way beyond error, something that's much more true, much truer and more profound about what guides human behavior, which is people do what they damn well please. You know, I do it, sometimes you do it, you know, it's there, there's that unpredictable side of who we are. The other piece of it, though, is that in trying to understand human behavior, what's often left, is left out is the power of another variable, which is intentions. In fact, the strongest predictor of behavior in the immediate future isn't past behavior, it's not early developmental experience, it's not genetics or biology, it's intentions. So I, I, in my intro psych class, I sometimes give the example of how I can make this amazing prediction of what my students are going to be doing the next day at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, even though I don't know anything about their personality, nothing about their biology, nothing about their early developmental experience, all I have to do is ask one question. You know what it is? I ask him, so what do you plan to do tomorrow at 2 in the afternoon? <laughs> it's great. You can feel like, you know, the amazing magician here, the, the great seer. But the point is, is that our plans, our intentions, our goals are strong predictors of behavior in the future. If you go in the immediate future, if you take it a little further out, then it starts to break down. But at least in the immediate future, what we plan to do is a strong predictor of what we actually do. But more generally, it suggests that we're goal-directed beings. We're not simply driven by other forces. We also make plans, we have intentions, and that shapes behavior in part two. Viktor Frankl put it much more eloquently. He said that people who have a why to live for can deal with almost any how. He's talking about the need to have a sense of meaning, a sense of 
purpose, something that we're shooting for, that we're living for in our lives. And these, the, the vision or the dream we live for, call them strivings, are what help define our lives and make each of us distinctive in some ways. Our strivings define us. Sometimes in audiences I ask people to stand up and list their top 10 goals or strivings or dreams for themselves. And even in an audience of people, all therapists or people in mental health, there's really fascinating differences in what people strive for. We strive for psychological goals, social ends, physical ends, material ends. They make us distinctive. But we can also strive for spiritual ends, spiritual goals. And this may include a relationship with God or a higher power or divinity. But it can also include other sacred aspects of life. And so I think it's important to note when we talk about spirituality, we're talking about people seeking out some kind of relationship, connection, attachment to something sacred. That sacred may be, again, a traditional notion of God or divinity, but the sacred can also include things that go beyond that core of divinity to other aspects of life that are imbued with sacred status. And lots of things can take on sacred status, such as your meaning in life, your work, vocation. A job can be more than a job. It can be a vocation. Um, children, nature, time, all of these things can take on sacred qualities and become sacred in some respects. And in that sense, we can attach to a variety of sacred objects, not just God, but I'd broaden that out to other sacred aspects of life. I'm going to move on from some other slides I had on this. Oh, I'll, I'll show you one that I really like. Some of you have seen this before. This is from one of my uh, grad students who kept a diary as a child. This is when she was about, as an adolescent. She wrote this when she was about 14. And here you get the sense of how she sac sanctified or sacralized people. She wrote this. She said, God has a deep, raspy voice. God is a jazz singer. She's plush, warm, and rosy. God is a grandmother. He has the patient rock of an old man in a porch rocker. He hums and laughs. He marvels at the sky. Here's my favorite one. God coos at babies. She's a new mother. He's the steady, gentle hand of a nurse, the cool reassurance of a person pursuing his life's work, the free spirit of a young man wandering only to live and love life. So she sees God, the sacred, in people, in people around her. Now, what we hold sacred is special. Our sacred dreams, our sacred strivings are special in several respects. They become higher order goals. They become higher order organizing forces. What we hold sacred tends to be the greatest organizing force in our lives. And we organize other goals and other dreams beneath that, but it may define what we do with our lives in so many ways. We're also tenacious in the pursuit of things that are sacred. Why? Because they matter more to us than anything. So we're like bulldogs going after them and trying to hold on to the things that we hold sacred. One example, we did a study I playfully called God and the Bod, where we looked at the degree to which people reported that their bodies were sacred. We had a sanctification of the body measure. To what degree do you see your body as a temple of the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, a temple of God, container of the Spirit? And students who perceive their bodies as more sacred were more likely to take better care of their bodies. Physical care, less alcohol, drug use, better eating, more exercise, enough sleep. Why? Well, it's sacred. You protect and preserve what you hold sacred. We found that uh, married couples who see their marriages as sacred are less likely to engage in destructive communication methods. Why? Well, it's sacred. You preserve and you protect your, your loved one if they're sacred to you. We also found in another study that people, we did a study where we actually asked people what they held sacred and then did um, randomized phone calls during the day and over the next three weeks to look at how are they spending their thoughts, their time, their energy, and found that people 
that's, that's this slide, found that people devoted more thoughts to sacred matters, more action towards sacred uh, matters, and uh, more time to sacred issues in their lives compared to other strivings. So again, what we hold sacred tends to become an organizing force in our lives. And we derive meaning and satisfaction from that. So we've done several studies showing that people who see their jobs as vocations, sacred callings, are more likely to derive greater meaning from their work. It's not just a job. It's something that has deeper meaning to you. People who see marriage as sacred report greater satisfaction and pleasure, less likelihood to get divorced. It's sacred. People who see child rearing as a sacred task derive greater satisfaction and meaning from, chi uh, from child rearing. I enjoy this, this uh, finding. People who see sex as sacred uh, enjoy it more. And actually we've shown that they have it more often too. So it's a, uh, it's a stimulus for sexuality as well. Now I'm kind of belaboring this point about the nature of spirituality to set the stage for the key point. And the key point here is that suffering impacts us not only psychologically, socially, physically, but spiritually. Suffering can shake or shatter our sacred strivings. It can shake or shatter that which we hold most central to our definition. Suffering can cut into and through our deepest values, creating a loss of higher order, ultimate meaning and organization. In short, suffering can create troubled souls. I, I came across a quote recently on this. I don't think you have it there, but I like this, this quote um, from a, a veteran. He says, my body is covered with scars from my wars. Every time I look at my body, touch one of these scars, I touch again the reality of war. And when I touch the reality of war, I touch all the suffering that's intrinsic to war. In the past, when I felt pain from a scar, I tried to repress it, to hide it from myself. But the physical wounds are not the most significant wounds of war. The wounds of the soul, the spiritual wounds, the emotional wounds, they're far deeper, though less obvious. Now, my client, Susan, was not traditionally religious, but I'd suggest that she, too, had been deeply traumatized spiritually in terms of her deepest values, her organizing force in life, and the pathway she was taking to get there. Her life and all that had given meaning to it, she experienced as broken, and she felt paralyzed to do anything about it. She, too, was a troubled soul. I think it's very important to recognize that as a process, spirituality can be double-edged. It can be a source of pain and further suffering, but it can be a powerful resource. Let me say a little bit more about spirituality as a source of suffering. And this, you know, nowadays writings about spirituality seem to emphasize spirituality as a kind of an, an unadulterated good. That spirituality is by definition good. And this perspective takes issue with that, that certain forms of spirituality um, can be problematic and can make matters worse. But again, part of the power of suffering lies in its capacity to cut through and damage our ultimate values, the things that give us greatest meaning in life, those aspects of life that we hold most sacred. There are situations in life that seem to violate our core selves, our sense of ourselves as worthwhile human beings. I came across this very disturbing account that, that illustrates the point. It's the account of an eight-year-old girl who's writing about growing up and how her father had been arrested and jailed for indecent exposure. And so she'd been left under the care of her grandmother. And this is what she said. She said, my father's arrest humiliated my grandmother. In her anger, grandmother informed me, don't expect much from me. I have to take care of you, but I don't have to like it. I told your mother to have an abortion, but she wouldn't. You shouldn't be here. You shouldn't be alive. That cuts to the core of her identity, who she is. I mean, it's, it's a horribly traumatic type of experience. And what's the end result? Well, she says, I plunged into new depths of betrayal 
I really was a scummy little girl. I really wasn't ever going to be allowed to be regular, happy, and safe. It was stupid to think it could all work out. Fundamental trauma, but trauma, I think, of a spiritual nature, cutting to the core of who she is. Life events that threaten, damage, or violate our sacred values have, I think, especially toxic effects. We've done some studies along this line, and we found that life stressors that are perceived as sacred violations, violations of your most core values, your most core sources of meaning, are tied to greater distress. It may not be an amazing kind of finding, but I think it's, it's I think, uh, something that we've been able to show. Here's one example of a study we've recently done with 89 former spouses at the time of divorce and one year later, and many of them appraised the divorce as not just a loss, but a sacred violation. That SOB um, violated our sacred vows. And couples, uh, spouses, ex-spouses who perceived the divorce as a sacred violation were more likely to report anger and depression and distress one year later. They also reported higher levels of dysfunctional communication um, and depression. I should add, too, that we, we find something similar with moral injuries. There's a lot of literature coming out on moral injuries and among combat veterans and, and vets um, that Witnessing or participating in um, moral violations or sacred violations also appear to have really a special power for inducing shame, uh, humiliation, PTSD type symptoms. So these findings suggest that we're most vulnerable to suffering when we experience events that damage us at our deepest levels. And unfortunately, this knowledge has been used very, I think, uh, maliciously and planfully by groups all over the world to, to try to injure their enemies. I mean, it was certainly true in Nazi Germany when all the attempts were made to um, destroy Jewish values, uh, Jewish sacred objects, the Torahs, um, Jewish, uh, you know, Jewish, um, uh, the ritual prayers, Jewish ritual, the, the religious communities, the synagogues themselves, and we see it in other religious groups today as well that purposely seek out to destroy the sacred values of their enemies. With the loss of sacred values can come profound spiritual distress and struggle. People can be plunged into struggles involving tensions and conflicts about God and ultimate reality, about the ultimate purpose in life, questions about one's faith community. Um, uh, a few years ago, I worked with a, a man who was uh, 60 years old. He came to my office. Um, I told this story last year, I think. Some of you may have heard this before, so I apologize for repeating story. But um, African-American man who had, in the last five years, um, lost both of his parents, both of his adult sons who um, had cancer, and he nursed both of them, um, and his sister on, oh, and his brother most recently, and his sister had had a stroke on the way to the cemetery when his brother was being buried. This was in the last five years, and he came in suffering. This wasn't his first uh, set of traumas. He also described, he was a Vietnam vet, and described how on a combat patrol coming in from the patrol, his uh, unit was camped out and they drew straws to see who would get water for the unit. He lost, so he went to get the water. Well, his unit was shelled while he was getting the water and everyone was killed. So he had this history of tremendous exposure to trauma. And at one point in talking to him, I said, Jerry, in, if, of all of this, what do you find most difficult to deal with? What do you find most um, stressful in all of this. And he said, um, why? Why, God? Why is this happening to me? Of everything he was experiencing, the deepest trauma was the, the, the trauma involving ultimate meaning. He couldn't put it in, he didn't have a place to put it. He was a, uh, uh, he was a AME a deacon in his church, active in his church, and he couldn't find a place to put it in his own theology at that time. And so the deepest trauma was a spiritual trauma triggered by uh, tremendous loss at the deepest levels. 
we find that that combination of sacred loss and struggle is a double-edged blow. And the, the, similar, the study by Krumri, we found that, uh, if you look at the red line here, these are the folks who experience divorce as a sacred loss or desecration, and then experienced a spiritual struggle. They were the ones who were at highest risk for depression or becoming more depressed over the year. So that combination of sacred violation throwing people into spiritual chaos, profound questions about their deepest values and understandings, that seemed to be the highest risk factor. Uh, for the chaplains out here and the pastors, this is nothing new for you. Uh, the notion that, that suffering can have a spiritual quality and, can have, and that spirituality can exacerbate the nature of the suffering, you're well aware of that and you deal with it regularly. This is new, though, to social scientists and mental health professionals, but I think it's something we should know about in more depth. Now, the focus on spirituality as a source of suffering is incomplete. For most people, spirituality is the greatest resource. And let me highlight some of the spiritual resources that have already been alluded to here. One resource is being able to place the suffering into a larger context of meaning. Um, through religious and spiritual frameworks, people can see their suffering within a more ultimate perspective as a test, an opportunity to grow spiritually, a chance to grow closer to God or to the sacred, to form that relationship. For instance, a 72-year-old um, Mexican-American said that, uh, dealing with cancer, said, oh, well, yeah, kidney cancer, said, I believe we have to suffer to learn and give more value to his, Jesus' suffering. When I'm going through suffering, for example, when they found the tumor in my kidney, all I said was, God, I give it to you. It was nothing compared to what you suffered. Larger context of meaning. For some, the ultimate meaning may not be concrete. It may be the understanding that there is an ultimate meaning. I love this quote from Clifford Geertz, the anthropologist, who said, the effort is not to deny the undeniable that there are unexplained events, that life hurts, or that rain falls upon the just, but to deny that there are inexplicable events, that life is unendurable, and that justice is a mirage. So you may not have the perspective, you may not be able to articulate why you're suffering, but the knowledge that there is an ultimate meaning may be knowledge enough, and it's something people who are devout, or people who have a spiritual perspective, can draw on. Spirituality also offers sources of compassionate presence. And presence when other people, humans, may not be available. God, or a higher power, is constantly available. And as one HIV uh, woman said, she said, patient, she said, you ain't got no other choice in life as far as terms of relationships and stuff like that, but that's why I just try to keep a close relationship with God, because he don't look at you like that. And the spiritual support, again, I, I want to emphasize, doesn't have to come from traditional theistic sources. Um, one elderly Jewish man uh, whose parents died in Auschwitz attributed his survival not to God, but to art. Talk about another attachment object. He says, a lot of people would say, it's the hand of God that I survived, but I think no. My spiritual beliefs are shaped by my experiences, by my search for a meaningful life in the arts, and I found that. Art's something that you can hold on to outside the boundary of suffering and political instability. He's talking about art as a sacred object. Art is what's sacred, and the, there's the attachment to art. I really like this idea of broadening the notion of what do we attach to, especially as people age. Because I think as we age, I was just talking to Rabbi Karf about this, we attach to many other objects besides people necessarily. We can attach to a variety of things that become somewhat functionally autonomous in the words of Gordon Alport, as again Rabbi Karf reminded me, they become functionally autonomous of earlier motivations. So we become committed to art. We attach to our work. We may attach to a belief system and I think in some ways it'd be interesting to expand the attachment literature to other attachment objects. I think it'd be very fascinating to look at that. Um, 
and how that may work. Okay, and um, all right, well, let me move on here and note, I'm gonna skip one slide, and note that another really powerful resource of spirituality in, the pro in suffering has to do with transformation. Now, the first tendency in times of trouble for people, we all naturally try to hold on to and protect and preserve what matters most to us. But the reality is that suffering, because it, it shatters our most basic goals and strivings, we may need to make transformations of what we hold significant. Suffering may then be exacerbated by the unwillingness to let go. There are times we have to let go of what we care most about. But spiritual resources can really help in this process. I, I, on a personal note, I recall when my mother was in the hospital, she was dying of um, pancreatic cancer, uh, and she was a very uh, spiritual woman. Uh, I remember talking to her one time about what was helping to sustain her, what was keeping her going, because she was, I thought, just remarkable, focused on on her kids and, and my father, her husband, and being there for other people. And what, what she said was, what kept her going was, she said, she just wants to be an inspiration for us. Just wants to be an inspiration. Uh, she wanted to be a model for us about how you live and how you can die. And so, looking back on it, I, I think she had made that transformation. She had transformed from concerns about day-to-day -day kinds of things and making sure we're all okay and the more kind of daily kinds of activities to the more kind of cosmic realm. And I think that's something that people are, it's almost like you need the spiritual support to make that fundamental transformation. Another, um, oops, sorry. Another piece of that transformation is, I think, the notion of active surrender. And these terms are not really common among, within mental health and psychology, but the idea that there are times when it makes sense to just surrender. Now, surrender doesn't mean passivity and despair. Surrender can mean, active surrender at least, can mean giving up and giving it over to a benign kind of force or power. And within the religions of the world, the notion of letting go to larger forces in the universe has, I think, tremendous value. And here, th these are the words of a Muslim Jordanian patient who said that, you know, it was just to stay there and wait for what would happen to you, nothing definite there. My health would get worse at any time and I can't guess what would happen to me the next day. Everything was going fast. I just contacted myself with Allah. I prayed many times to Allah, asking him to save my life. It's entirely Allah's will, active, active surrender. Let me finish up here then by just commenting on a few aspects of a spiritually integrated approach to suffering. Um, just to highlight a few implications. Again, I think that fit with the wonderful presentation we've already had here. But one implication is, and I really want to stress this, which is to acknowledge the reality of suffering. If you believe that there's something special about suffering, then recognize it. Talk about it, encourage clients to talk about it. I think that clinical language in this regard is insufficient. It's not, I don't think I could work well with Susan, my client, by simply talking about her depression. I started to talk about her suffering. And she could talk very well about suffering. Suffering for her, that language resonated. She knew she was suffering, I could talk with her about it. I think to reduce suffering to a purely clinical entity will lead to disconnection and the feeling that the practitioner just doesn't understand. I, I, I would add that I think to do that, and I think Anne alluded to this, we have to be, and, and John too, we have to be able to tolerate the pain ourselves that comes with acknowledging the reality of suffering. The inability to tolerate that pain, I think, can lead to um, I might call it, I wish Bob were here because I'd, I'd ask him about it. I'd call it premature um, gratitude. I, I think there's, a, there's certainly a place for gratitude in dealing with suffering, but timing is key. And to work with someone who's suffering and then ask them 
to identify the positive and the things they can be grateful for. It has its place, but you better know when to do it, right? There's also, I think, such a thing for the pastors in the audience, there's such a thing as premature redemptive theology. Carrie Doring, who is a, a colleague of mine, a, a pastor and a psychologist, she's made that point. She noted, she was in Denver, and she noted she was at the, the Aurora Theater um, service following the shootings, and a number of religious leaders offered prayers, and for the most of the prayers were the theme of resurrection and the afterlife. And, and for, these are people who had just lost loved ones in the last week encouraging the survivors to move towards healing. And Carrie said that only a few of the leaders encouraged what she said, a period of lament for their suffering. And she maintained that, from her point of view at least, that people who are suffering have to have a period of lamentation. And it's kind of the notion that, yeah, you have to, you don't want to get lost in the suffering, but you need to acknowledge it and to recognize it's there and then at some point you'll be able to move forward, but if you try to move to redemption or gratitude or focus on the positive too quickly, then you're not honoring the suffering itself. You're not giving people a chance to attend to it, to be mindful of it, to connect to it. I think it's a very, a really important point. Another important point here is placing suffering in larger perspective. What John Allen might talk about is mentalizing suffering in the, in, in, among clients. It's vital to help our clients place suffering in a larger perspective. And what do I mean by that? Well, I like to help, with Susan, I try to help her see suffering as an experience rather than a fixed entity, as a process rather than a static thing. And I, I, I really struggled myself to figure out how to help her do that. And what I finally came up with that I think was pretty helpful was I asked her to bring in mementos of her earlier life. Because she, she was remarkable in what she had accomplished. So she brought in trophies from her marathons. She brought in her college degrees, letters from people that she had touched. And I asked her to share these symbols of her life with me. And for the first time, I saw her smile. I had never seen her smile. For the first time, at one point, she even laughed. And I, I, when she laughed, it just like, it's like something lifted. It was like a, a really a wonderful moment in the therapy. But she was getting in touch with her wholeness as a human being. And the point I stressed with her was that there's more to her life than suffering, that suffering was part of her life story or narrative, but there are other parts of her story as well. And so we could begin to shift the, the focus from dealing with suffering to questions like, how have you survived to this point? How have you made it through? What's giving you the strength to go on with the knowledge that suffering is just a part of the stream of life? It's not all of life. And I think that was tremendously helpful to her. And I, we, that, I think that's the thing that probably made the most difference to her in terms of placing her suffering in a larger perspective. We've already talked some about being spiritually present with someone who's suffering, and that's the antidote to disconnectedness, to be there, to be present, to look them in the eye, to be able to just sit and listen. I think that was what was most helpful with my client, Jerry, who was coming in after losing you know, the devastating loss of his family, just sitting there with him, looking him in the eye, uh, as he talked about all of his losses, was the most, single most helpful thing that I did with him. No quick, easy fixes. I offered no platitudes, no reassurance. I just sat and listened and told him how touched I was that he was willing to share his story with me. So we just sat quietly, oftentimes, in the midst of his suffering. And then encouraging a transformation of, of, of purpose. Again, because people who suffer may have lost the things that, make, make, that matter most to them, they often need help in letting go. It's not something we do a lot in our work, helping people let go. We're good at trying to help people hold on. We're tenacious with our clients to help them be tenacious. But helping people let go is, is more of a challenge. And yet there are things that we can do. One of my former students developed an intervention for women with cancer, and she called it the breath of God. 
Well, you have it in your handout, I think. And if you see in the second paragraph, it's really a meditation where she's encouraging her, the, the women to meditate on what they can l let go. What can they surrender? What can they give up? What can they give over to God? The serenity prayer is another example of a, a, a prayer to help people let go. I was talking to my brother, who's a physician, about this, and he said, well, maybe this story may be relevant. He told me the story about working with a dying patient um, who pretty angrily asked my brother, you know, I'm, I'm sick of all of this. Why should I bother to live? I just should just end it all. And my brother, he said, he told him, he said, well, you should live because you can tell your loved ones things you never said but wish you had. He said, you should live because you can, you'll have time now to reflect on your life and what it's been all about for you. He said, and you should live because you can treasure the good moments you still have and the hope that you'll still have good moments. Um, a few years ago, or actually several years ago now, I was at a meeting with a foundation where they were trying to figure out what did they want to support? What was their mission? And actually, I don't know if you remember this, Phil, but you were there. And I think Bob was there too. And it was very interesting because uh, Phil was talking about um, supporting research on compassion and love and forgiveness. And we were all you know, very much behind it. And I then raised my hand <laughs> and said, uh, well, you know, I think it's also important to look at the flip side. I think we really need to support more knowledge about suffering, uh, hatred, and evil. <laughs> and I have to say, Phil supported me. He said he thought that was a great idea, too. But that, that, that didn't go anywhere. Well, I think that's a real shame, because we need to know more about the darker side here. And I think that suffering really underscores the biopsychosocial spiritual nature of experience. Um, and any effort to respond to pain should include attention to suffering. Um, in responding to suffering, we as, as helping professionals really have to be willing to grapple with the, the deepest and yes, the darkest dimensions of human experience. We do need a psychology of suffering. Thank you. Is the mic working? Yes, it is. Okay. You know, a long time ago when <coughs> Robin Burks was a, a psychology intern at Baylor, she told me about Ken, this guy named Ken Pargament at Bowling Green where she had done her undergraduate work. And that's how I got introduced to positive and negative religious coping. A few years later than that, I went to a conference at Duke and heard him uh, to give a presentation. and. I realized not only that his work influenced a lot of my thinking every day clinically, but what Ken brings to any topic is just extraordinary as a human being as well as a, a fantastic scholar. And I bet a lot of you are thinking the same thing out there right now. Ken, while they're uh, bringing forward a few of the cards, I'm going to ask you a question <coughs> having to do with a, the thing about uh, sanctification, the work that you and, and Ed Mahoney and other people have really uh, brought to uh, my attention in a new kind of way recently. And the question I have is when you're working with somebody who is suffering and you're trying to figure out where sanctification fits in their ability to do things or to not do things, do you think of yourself as responding to the sanctification capacity the person has? Or are there ways in which you can cultivate the notion of sanctification in people who are suffering? Yeah, I, I was telling Phil and uh, Bob on the way over here that, Bob, that uh, Jim comes up afterwards and makes some comments or questions. And I say, that those are always the most provoking, provocative, thoughtful questions you would ever imagine. And I'm usually prepared for almost any question. And then Jim comes up and comes up with these doozies. And, they <laughs> and they're such good questions. And, you know, I have to, you know, that's worth like, you know, another three months of thinking about that one. But yeah, I think part of, the, part of the, the challenge in one of the implications of this work is really as a clinician, 
attending to what the client or the patient may hold sacred. What is it that is of deepest value to them? And to really try to get them to articulate it. That's useful in two respects because in one respect, the suffering may be very much tied to the loss of what was sacred. It may be their role as a breadwinner. It may be being able to be there um, for their family. It may be able to just be physically active and not a burden on other people. So that really helps understand what is the true impact of, of the suffering. On the other side, knowing what's held sacred, what's sanctified, also may become a tremendous resource to help them understand, okay, well, you have other things in your life that you still hold sacred. How can you nurture that? How can you cherish that? How can you continue to use that to support and sustain you through your most difficult times? So again, the idea that knowing what people hold sacred can be a resource, and, but it can also help identify how their spirituality is, is really exacerbating the suffering that they're experiencing. In either case, it becomes conversation. And I bet if you're a kin argument, the way in which you find out those things probably expands what the person does with it, too. So thanks for a wonderful participation today by all our speakers. Uh, <coughs> do remember, if you need CE credits, to pass in your uh, forms as you leave.